Welcome back to another example of projectile motion. Now this example 3F is very similar to the previous example 3E with one very key distinction. So Flynn is our new baseball thrower and is standing on the top of a roof. But unlike L who threw up at an angle, Flynn is throwing a baseball with an initial velocity at a 20 degree angle below the roof edge. So what that looks like is below the roof edge by a 20 degree angle. And if you compare this picture to the previous one, you can see why, why we have this phrasing above and below the roof edge. Some students put the 20 degree angle in here, but that is not how that angle is described. The roof edge is kind of a horizontal flat plane and we threw above it before, and now we're throwing below it. As soon as we see a vector at an angle, we break it up into components. That needs to be a mantra that we just kind of repeat to ourselves enough until when we're sleeping, we just hear that phrase in our heads, that when we see a vector at an angle, we break it into components. So the really, really key thing here is this down arrow is extremely important for chapter three to be counted as negative. We did this in chapter two, and it's still true in chapter three. All right, so there's not much space over there. I'll, I'll write over here. The V naught X, as I've drawn it, is to the right, so it's positive. And the hypotenuse is 15. Since it's the adjacent side, we're gonna use cosine of 20 degrees. And so we get 14.1 meters per second, positive 14.1 meters per second. The initial y velocity, on the other hand, because I have drawn it downwards, it needs a minus sign. And the 15 is still the hypotenuse, but this is the adjacent, nope, this is the opposite side. So it's the sine of 20 degrees. And so really important, we have this minus sign and then it's 5.13 meters per second. We are starting horizontally at zero because we're just gonna move farther away from the building, but we are starting at the top of a building, and so we will have an initial height of 55 meters. Okay, picture, list of given information, those are steps one and two complete. So for part A, we're finding the time when the ball reaches the ground, when we fill in our blanks, find blank, when blank, the last three examples have all had this same question in it, find t when y equals zero. So that means we use the yt equation. So y equals y naught plus v naught yt minus one half gt squared. All right, so we plug in numbers. Zero equals 55 plus negative 5.13. Without that negative sign, we have made a completely different problem. That is a huge physics error, and it is not a small math error. That negative sign is absolutely key. All right, so when we clean this up, we get 55 minus 5.13t minus 4.9 t squared. All right, so this is another case where we have the quadratic formula. So with the quadratic formula, we always have this idea of A, B, and C. A is the thing attached to t squared, that's minus 4.9. B is the thing attached to t, that's minus 5.13. And C is the thing all by itself, positive 55. Everything has to be on the same side of the equation. Negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. So let's plug in some numbers. We have negative times negative 5.13 plus or minus. In parentheses, we have the 5.13 or the minus 5.13. So 
so that when we square it, that minus sign is going to go away. Very important for us. Minus 4 times negative 4.9 times 55. All of that was under the square root. And then the whole entire thing is all over 2 times negative 4.9. All right, so two negatives make a positive. 5.13 plus or minus... 2 times negative 4.9 is negative 9.8. So all of that stuff underneath the parentheses or underneath the square root, when we take care of the minus signs and then we also take care of the square root, that whole term becomes 33.2. So now we have two possibilities. If we add these two together up top and then divide by negative 9.8, we will get negative 3.9 seconds. And if we take 5.13 minus 33.2 and divide by negative 9.8, we will get positive 2.87 seconds. And that becomes our correct answer. We don't have time travel in physics, and if we're thinking about the motion of the ball at the top of the roof, we were throwing it downwards, there is this kind of parabola shape where to get from this point to the ground, it takes 2.87 seconds. To get from this point over to the roof, where it's now going downwards, it would take 3.9 seconds. So these two numbers always have mathematical meaning, but this is the one that fits our actual situation. All right, so part B. Keeping in mind that a couple of seconds in the air does make sense for our last check, we can move on to part B, where we are finding x when t equals 2.87 seconds. We've had this problem, or we've had this question show up in several problems, and so we know that that means it's going to be the xt equation. So we're well acquainted with this equation now. And we plug in 0 plus 14.1 times 2.87 and we get as a result 40.4 meters. So the ball ended 40.4 meters away from the building. Shorter distance away because it was already on the way down when we threw it. Flynn threw downwards at an angle instead of up and so it's got less time in the air before it hits the ground. And then I don't really have a lot of space for a lot of math, but if we look at what question C is actually asking us, we need to recognize that every single problem that we do, one of the big reasons why we draw a picture is so that we can start to think about the actual situation. If we are on the top of a building, throwing down at an angle, the maximum height is going to just be the building. We don't want to default to throwing numbers into equations because that's what we think physics is all about. Physics is about problem solving, and if we are standing on the top of a building and throwing downwards, it will never get higher than where it started. The maximum height is 55 meters by definition, and this question is here to make sure that we're actually looking at the picture that we draw. We do not want to always default to throwing numbers into equations before we've had a chance to think about what we're, what we're doing. And that's, this is one chance for us to really hit that question home. On the slides, when this normally comes up in lecture, there's a note at the bottom. One of these parts doesn't require a calculator, um, and that's this part here, where it's thinking about the situation gets us the answer and not using are more complex tools when there is no equation to have to solve. All right, there are two questions left, uh, or two examples left to go through for chapter three. Both of them have a slightly different feel to the last several, but they still use the exact same problem solving process. And so I will see you in those last two videos.